Okay, um, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Ramesh Shamalinga. I'm working as a developer in uh, ThoughtWorks. And today's our topic is going to be on JavaScript. And actually we have the name uh, fundamentals explained earlier. And just we changed for some fake name and it's called Knowing Mansus. Sorry. No, 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 different in the presentation. Ashok? Okay. Okay, stop. Right. Um, yeah. Okay, it's, it's going to be about like uh, JavaScript and like what are the basic, uh, basic building blocks of JavaScript and how they really work behind it? Like, and it's not, I'm not going to take you through like all the basic building blocks of uh, JavaScript because like it takes a lot of time to get through it. We're going to see uh, some of the uh, building blocks which is like we are more, most often heard, uh, hearing about and like we'll be using it in our day to day life. Okay. And what we are going to see is like uh, we are going to see about the crazy facts which we can find about. Uh, JavaScript and internet. Like when you go and search on the internet, you'll be getting uh, lots of crazy facts about uh, JavaScript, like how it behaves, like very differently in uh, what environment and surfaces most of one. And it's most yeah, it's mostly going to be about some of the basic building blocks and then how it's working in these uh, behind the scenes. Okay, uh, the agenda is pretty much is going to be like uh, hosting and how how working was uh, behind and then hopes, closure, this, and then new. Okay. Okay, um, before we start into the uh, main agenda, like uh, a brief history about uh, what is JavaScript is like, uh, and how it has evolved. And actually JavaScript has been uh, created by Brandon Eek in 1995. And it's what we are seeing in this screen. And actually, it was initially released in Netscape Navigator 2.0 where I think with the name of Mocha, and then it has changed to uh, Lash Script, and then uh, later, uh, actually, uh, Netscape and Microsoft, uh, some microsystems were, were there in the collaboration at that time, and then they changed the name to JavaScript to be aligned with Java so that like it gets more attention. And later point of time, uh, they have created uh, Egmo Script in 1997 which is like uh, most of people uh, what is script is like it's a list of specifications which can be implemented in the languages to support like a general purpose vendor neutral uh, language so mostly uh, what they will do is like they will create a list of specifications which should be implemented in the uh, languages so what the implementers will do is like they will follow the specifications and they will implement all those standards in their language so that like every vendors like for example uh, in our case like for JavaScript we are having too many uh, uh, compilers uh, which is given in the bottom of the page which is like VH, Spider Monkey, and then Nitro and so many so many others so like everybody will follow the standards and then they will implement it so that like it will behave same in every environments and for that to create the list of uh, specifications there is a committee called uh, Technical Committee 39, that's PC39, which uh, group of people they were, where they are working with uh, uh, among themselves and then they are creating a set of standards and they are publishing it. Those standards will be having a list of stages that is called from stage 0 to stage 4. Uh, this is like, uh, like how they evolve, the, how a particular uh, specification evolves in the uh, their proposals. It's normally called like a uh, straw man and then proposal and sorry draft proposal and then uh, candidate and then finished. 
So if it is finished, then it is fully implemented in most of the, uh, I mean, it's a full, full flesh form of a specification, which can be implemented everywhere, everywhere. You might have seen this, if you are using Babel, then you might have seen this page 0, 1, 2, 3 in there. And they are just the specifications for what are the uh, uh, specification, I mean, uh, standards levels you are going to support. <coughs> okay. And, okay, uh, before we get into the uh, real uh, like, uh, agenda, if you have any questions or like if I'm going fast, please stop me and then so that like I can explain you. Uh, and question, uh, if you have any questions, please stop me and then ask. Okay, uh, how many of you have the word costing and use most of them? Or, okay. okay, let's see what costing means in, I mean, in dictionary. This is the last four dictionary definition, which is given uh, for costing. It means like we are just lifting up something with the use of pulleys or ropes. And ropes sorry. So the, uh, this means like we are lifting something up from the bottom. So what is to do with JavaScript? Here, this is like, in JavaScript, we have the declarations for our variables, our functions. So they are lifted when that code is getting executed. So it lifted from the bottom of your code, wherever. It's not just for your bottom of your code, it can be any, anywhere. If the, there are any declarations for your functions or variables, it will be lifted to the up, and then it gets executed. That's what hoisting normally means. <coughs> okay. Okay, let's see a demo here. Sorry. Okay. Can you guess the output of this function? Because like that's not like normal Java like code. Uh, which is have uh, we do it in other languages? Any guesses? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. It will run normally. It won't throw any error because like we have declared a variable called poem at the bottom, but we have used in the top. But still, it's not complaining or anything, and then it just runs like a normal code. And it's the same case when you go to the function declaration system. Like here also we have used the same kind of uh, technique. Like we have used the uh, function which is even before uh, getting declared. And if you run it, it will run like term and then like, it will give the result. But how it happens in the, uh, the, uh, like, uh, the real compiler. I'll just show you uh, how it runs in the compiler. But like before that, like how it does like uh, normally like if it lifts up, it doesn't lift up your code physically. I mean like it not just copy it and cuts your code and then puts in the top and then it runs. It don't doesn't do that. What it does like whenever you execute your code in JavaScript engines, it will execute your code in two phases. The first phase is called actually there is no uh, I mean layer. Um, standard names for these phases. I just given the pair names so that like people can understand it better. So the first phase is called uh, compile phase, where what it will do is like it will go through your uh, code from line zero, I'm um, sorry, line one to uh, end of your uh, code, and it will look out for the uh, declaration. It can be any variable declaration or it can be a, a function declaration. It will go through the code and it will see the declarations. And if there is any declaration is done, it will do the declaration for uh, alone for us. And then it will again go to the next phase where it will start from your uh, line one again and it will start to run. If, at this time, it will start to run your exact code, not the declaration. It will leave, a, leave the de declaration part alone and then it will run the, uh, the rest of the code. So this is how it really happens, the hard thing happens. Okay. And this is the uh, program, and this is how it happens. Like, this is uh, now in the uh, like uh, compile phase, and in compile phase, it just goes through the line, uh, line three, and then point, uh, I mean the variable was added, and then it again runs in the uh, normal mode. You can see it now again, it again like it goes through the compile mode, 
goes to the first line, second line does not do anything, and then the third line it finds a bare declaration and does a declaration, and then again it goes to the next uh, phase and then starts from the line zero, uh, sorry one, and then it runs and does the uh, work. So what will happen if we have another variable uh, that is assigned assigned from another variable? I'm sorry. If we have one variable that is uh, getting assigned from another variable. Yep. So what will happen if uh, if we travel this way? You mean like uh, we have two different variables and one variable? Personal variable for and equal to another variable. Yeah, it will like uh, it will run like normal. The only difference is like in your first phase, it will do the declarations alone. It won't take care of anything at all. It will just do the declarations. Uh, you, for example, in your case, you have if you have two di two different variables, it will do the declaration for the two different variables, and then in the second phase, it will start from there and it will ex execute whatever you have written. Like for example, if you're assigning from one variable to another variable, it will. So, uh, so the time itself process will identify uh, which type it is. Because actually, uh, JavaScript is a dynamic type, so it doesn't care about it. Okay, so, well, uh, basically, while assigning the value on system is designing on which type it is. Mm -hmm. While assigning the value on system is identifying yeah. which type it is. So, the statement is like variable y1 equal to, we have another variable over there. So, that time the system is, uh, uh, while declaration is, it needs to identify the type or not? No, it won't identify the type. It won't, it won't worry about it. Like whenever you assign the value, it will just add this and inverse it, and inverse from it, and then it will work on. So it, it, there is no uh, like it's not a static, it's a dimension. Okay. Let's go to the second example which we have seen. This also happens the same for a uh, function where when the function declaration happens. Like in the first phase, it just uh, adds a function into your memory, and then in the second phase, it fails to use it. So that's why we don't get any error for like using a particular variable or function before even before we are declaring. Okay. Any questions on that? Cool. And do we have variable definitions within the function? I'm sorry? Do we have variables in JavaScript so we define variables within the function? Yep. What happens is like uh, actually we have a kind of uh, example uh, later, but like I'll explain you. Actually, it goes by the uh, scopes. Like first, it will run through the uh, global scope, and it will do the declarations for the global scope alone. And then, whenever the particular function is getting caught, it will iterate to the particular function and it will define the uh, function scope, and it will add the declaration first. So it won't do for all the functions at the first step. Level. Whenever you are getting uh, caught, it will do the uh, like uh, the two iterations. Okay. Yeah, the execution and yeah. So is there any performance issue like that in your JavaScript? Actually, this is done for optimizing your uh, performances. So with this only, they are obtaining more performance. Like it's not like a normal uh, language, right? Like where when you're like you have a separate build time and you're building and everything and doing it, and then you're running it in separate ways. So this is done for that purpose. Uh, this is the uh, uh, for function which we, I mean, the example which we have seen in the previous step, and this is same like it. So what will we get for as a result for the second one? For the first one, we got the uh, like the global word got console log uh, correctly. So what will be uh, good for the second one? Can you guess it? I'm sorry. Same as No. You know, you get something. Okay. There is something. No, like. Yeah. We'll get an error. Can you guess it, boy? Because there is no function declaration. Yeah, there is no function declaration here. We are using a uh, function expression. Actually, what we are doing is like we are declaring a variable, and for that variable, we are assigning a particular function. So what happens is like when you run this code, it will add the variable uh, called print author in the memory, but it won't have anything at all. But in the second iteration only, it will try to add it. But like even before adding it, we are just calling it, so it will get type error because like it is an undefined value, so you get a type error. So this is the difference between like. How you're using it in a, during expression, and then how you're using it in the normal function iterations. Okay. 
Okay. So, any any other questions? Okay. Here the next thing is called scope and closures. Right. Actually, uh, when I started preparing for the slides, like I I really got confused, like which to put first and which to put a second because like hosting, scope, closure, everything is so much interrelated and like uh, like. Uh, explain one will uh, raise a question and then another. So I just combined scope and closure here. So we'll see what closure is. This is the uh, dictionary, and, and again the dictionary uh, declaration for sorry definition for the uh, scope. So like everybody would have heard about like uh, what scope is, right? Can can, can anyone tell what scope is in in, in any language? Coverage area. Yeah, coverage area for. Yeah, any kind of variables. If you have some any tokens to get resolved, what is the coverage area for it? That's normally it. Like, that's what the uh, diff normal definition also tells about. And here, normally we have two types of scopes in our languages. One is lexical, and the next one is dynamic. Lexical scoping is like uh, the scope is defined based on your the uh, code return time, like how you are writing your code. It's not like the name resolution, like that's what we are doing. It's like whenever you are encountering a word, like variable or any function, you are just trying to resolve it, right? Then resolution happens based on your how you have written the code, like how you are nesting your code. That's that's what called a lexical uh, uh, like scoping, and the another type is called dynamic scoping, which is mostly used in Perl and other uh, scripting languages. Like this is like when in dynamic scoping, when you're trying to resolve a particular name or token, it resolves through your execution context. Like in in your stack, it you goes down to your stack. Like if uh, I'm not able to find any uh, variable in the top of the stack, it will go on like one level down and then go on another one level down till it finds. So that's the difference between your uh, lexical and dynamic scopes. Okay. Okay. And what we are using in uh, JavaScript is like lexical scopes. So it normally done uh, <coughs> resolutions based on lexical scope. And we have mainly like uh, before ES six, mostly we had global scope that's very normal. Like for uh, every program, will be having global scope. And then another scope which we had is function scope. So whenever you create our function, a new scope will be created for it. We did not have a, a block scope uh, for before uh, ES6, except very few exceptions. Like um, I'll tell you about the, uh, them later in the your block scopes. Okay, we have after ES6, like we have a new uh, kind of scope which is called block scope. Which is done for both let and const. Whenever you're uh, using let or const for declaring your variables or uh, variables, it will create a block scopes. For example, <coughs> if you're declaring a variable inside your if condition, it will create a scope only for that block alone. Okay. So this is normal for like ES6, right? But what about for the uh, like try cache? This is the exception we have. Try cache and with are the two exceptions we have for uh, block scopes. Because like before ES6, we do not have a concept called block scopes. But still there, we had a block scope with, uh, for the uh, try cache and uh, with. Okay. So in try cache, in catch section, you'll be uh, having the block scope. And for with operator, which is not a, actually recommended, now if you are using strict mode, uh, like uh, 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 the stick mode will complain you that you should not use with it's it's normally du duplicated from current uh, standards. So after that, like polluting the scope, how you can pollute your scope? Normally, polluting sco scope happens when you are trying to do something uh, dynamically. When you are like using your width, it will do it, and then when you are using evolve, <coughs> and you are, I mean compile your code dynamically. Then it will pollute your scope, like it will dynamically create some variables and add a to your scope so that like it get polluted. <coughs> and so to avoid this, what you can do is like you can use strict mode. 
in a strict mode, if you are using a strict mode, and if you are using evolve or uh, you cannot use width because like it will complain about we are using width and it, it cannot be, it will throw you error. And if you use uh, evolve, it will not allow any uh, variables or anything outside of its evolve scope. It will not pollute your outer scope. It will just stop it there itself. Okay. We'll just see a demo here. Somewhat. Okay. Can anyone guess what will be the output for this? I'll just explain it. We have a uh, in outer we have a variable called bass, and then we have a function, and then yeah, we have a function called uh, foo, and then say that we have another one function, sorry, variable called bass. And then we have another one in a state function called bar, and then there is another variable called bash, and then we just try to print it. So, can anyone guess what happens? What will happen here? If you are We are different to us, like we are just calling the function foo, and then we return function bar. <laughs> And then we are trying to call that uh, function bar immediately. So it will try to. Yeah, exactly. It will print you uh, like, I'm just trying. It will print you from function scope. And uh, another one thing, which is we are using VAS, which is called global accident this is because like whenever uh, we run a function it creates a scope right inside we have this stack and it will try to resolve one by one and whenever it finds for, for the first time it will just come back and then with the value which is there in the scope so that's why though we have the uh, same variable in the outer scope we don't go there and fetch it we just get it from the immediate scope one. I'll just explain the uh, like pictorial format. This is the same function which we have seen in the uh, example demo. What happens is like when you are uh, trying to run the code, it just goes through the uh, global scope and creates a global scope for you. And then after that, it encounters a function called Sorry, it, it has two variables, one is uh, bias and then another one is uh, function foo. It's added to the uh, global scope and then it tries to run the function foo and inside that, it, for, for right, uh, sorry, executing function foo, it creates another one scope inside global scope, that is two scope. Inside that, we are having a variable called bass and a function called bar and then i'm trying to call the bar function immediately so when we're trying to call the bar function it creates a scope for bar and actually inside bar we are having a variable bass and we are trying to assign a value for it so what it does is like when we are trying to do it it checks is there any variable in bar scope no there is nothing so it just goes one level above and checks whether is there a variable called uh, vast, no nothing there. So it goes one level above, that's the last level that's called uh, that's a global scope and it checks whether is it there, it is there, it's not there. But what it does is like whenever you ask uh, some installation, I mean like uh, something for from the uh, global scope variable, if it is not there, it will create one for you. And then it just gives, uh, gives uh, reference to it. And if you assign the value, it gets added to the global scope because it's created in the global scope. And then, like, we are just printing it. That's why we are able to access the VAS outside of its uh, you know, scopes, like in the global scope. So, is it clear? Anybody have any doubt? Like, so, this is called the uh, lexical scope. Like, we have the same kind of. Uh, 
the structure like how we have defined our code the same kind of structure is defined in this uh, scopes also so this is called uh, lexical scopes okay any questions cool okay what is closure now Okay, uh, if you find, if you try to find the closure definition in internet, it's like, it's more only, it's difficult to find the practical definition for the closure and like, this is the definition which is given in the MDN, like for the closure. Closure is nothing but a function with its lexical scope where the function is in. And this is what I mean, like, this is not like an external thing which you can define things anything, which is the closures, you are using it everywhere whenever you are trying to use your scope. So it's it's there with your scope. You just need to fill it, that's it. And that's like, um, there is another guy called Kyle Simpson. His definition to closure is like, if a function can access its scopes out, even it is uh, called from outside of its uh, scope level. That's called closure, that's his definition. Again, the both, they both are same, because like, the function is taking its current scope everywhere where it goes. So that's got closure. Okay, so here we'll see a demo. Okay. Okay, I have taken a very classic example. We are using for like most of our examples. This is called uh, like we have a function called adder, which takes a base value, and then it again returns your uh, another function, and then you can use that function to increment like for example if i'm giving 10 for the function uh, base value it will give you a function so whatever you uh, give uh, give for the uh, your return value it will just add by 10 every time <coughs> so this is like this function will create an average for you like here we are we have cost 10 for the average function it has given you a another one function that function will add us a add by 10 so whatever you pause for the add by 10, it will add by 10. If I'm pausing 2, it will return 12, something like that. This is called currying and functional uh, like programming. Okay, so if I do this, like I'm again calling the same uh, add a function and I'm pausing 5. So what will happen? I'm sorry? I have called the add, add a function uh, already and I have passed 10 and I got the result and it's adding correctly. And I'm trying to add, I'm sorry, I'm trying to reuse the same function and I'm just pausing 5. So what will be the output for the second one? Yes, <coughs> yep. That's because of its closure, because like it takes the function which is inside it takes its closure wherever it goes. So that's why though I have done, uh, declared it for the past time with different values, it again creates another one scope and it takes it with, uh, with it. So that's why it works correctly whenever we pause different value and we carry it. So we can, you can see that like if I add, add by 10, it just 12, it gives 12 and then for pi plus 2 it is 7 and then if I again try to add, uh, sorry, try to use add by 10 with 16, it just gives 26 because like it's normal. Let me see how. We, we have the same function here and we'll see like how it really works in the uh, compiler. It's same like what, how we have seen for uh, the scope example. It's same here. So we have the outer scope, it is global, and then we have a function called uh, adder. And then inside of it, it tries to uh, like call the adder function. So it adds uh, adder scope, and then it adds the base value, and then the inner function I just named it with the variable so that like it's easy to identify and then it has a different scope and then it goes to the next uh, for like line which is like again we are calling add function with the value of phi it creates another scope and it takes it with the uh, assigned function so that's why like the one scope does not affect <coughs> the other ones 
Okay. Any questions so far? Which is the closure here? I mean, which which part is the closure? Uh, that's why right. closure is not like a uh, physical thing or like okay. which you can see like scope. Closure can be defined as like a function with its uh, own lexical scope. That's called uh, closure. So that's what we are seeing right here. It's just like, uh, like what we are understanding okay. rather than like uh, what really defines like a scope or something else. So that's why people are most mostly getting uh, like direct, redirected or like something like confused about like what closure is and they're not able to find uh, identify it separately. So you said that uh, every variable is added to the global scope. No, whatever you have declaring the global scope, only you will go to the global. So in previous example, uh, one by one, uh, you just had plus and uh, so in that uh, while uh, getting the variable b is there, it just has to the global scope. Right? That's because like it was not declared anywhere. Okay. If it is declaring some any of the scope, it will get added to that particular scope alone. What happens is like if you you have not declared any uh, variable, but you are trying to access it. So what happens is like it just goes down your uh, scope from your like next uh, scope level three, two, one, ten, and then zero, which is the global scope. What happens is like the other scopes will say like I don't have it, just so go down. But the global scope is the last scope. What it will do is like it will just create a one for you if it is not there, and then it will give you. So that like it, it just uh, you're uh, you're getting the memory leak there. That's why we are not uh, normally using to do it that way. We normally use we have to use this take mode and then other linters and other things to avoid this kind of unavoidable uh, I mean accidental errors. Even var was not there. I don't know if it was a or var. You know that was not there. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, uh, the next one which we are going to see about is like this. Another one thing which is most and using in uh, JavaScript is this. Because like if you are using some other languages like C Sharp or Java or anything, what this will do? Let's put the running class box. I'm sorry? Let's put the same object of the class. Yes. Is there anything meaning? Current I'm sorry? Yeah, that's right. There is no other main thing. I am just trying to ensure like there is no other means. Okay. But in JavaScript, if you try to do, there are these many kinds as actually there is one more I have in the next slide. There are totally five kinds of bindings that can be done to this. Okay. So what normally do is like uh, this is like uh, whenever you use this, the value of this is uh, in a, for example, if you are using this in a uh, function called a, when the, uh, this way value, value of this is determined based on how you are solving the function a. So that's why we have so many different kinds of this values in our uh, JavaScript. So normally what kind of we have different kinds, like I'll just read by one by one. The first one is default binding, which we are getting by default, we are not doing anything at all, and we are getting something in this, that is default binding, and the next, next one is object binding, that's what you have in the name, all the other languages, and then the next one is like explicit binding, you can bind explicitly using call or apply, and then the another one is hard binding, with, with, uh, with, uh, like, with bind you can achieve this. And then the another one binding that is uh, created when you are using new against your function. Okay. Okay. Let's see how this works. Okay. I just have a browser set up, and I'm trying to just access this like this dot city. And then I'm just assigning value, uh, value and I'm trying to write it. So I have, for example, if I run it, what will happen? It just writes coin to two because like, I have tried to access like this dot city 
it gives promises and also I don't use this and then I try to uh, try uh, trying to uh, write it directly and it, it still gives uh, city because like your global scope is linked with sorry uh, your window sorry this is linked with uh, your global scope so whatever you're putting it in the uh, global scope it will get uh, get to there that's why you're getting it normally like this uh, in browser is referred to a uh, window so like if you put this dot window dot window dot it will just go like because like it's self-referenced and it will just go like uh, forever and this is the case for uh, browsers but what will happen when you have it in the uh, uh, like node.js if you're trying to run it from the node.js what you will get if you're trying to use this any case the city variable should be declared first for the class mm -hmm. okay so okay uh, let's leave this uh, example now what normally uh, this will be in uh, for example if you are using it outside like in your uh, you are taking a file and you are just writing <coughs> to write it I cannot reproduce it because like uh, in REPL it ran, uh, runs every code inside another function so like that scenario will not occur here okay what it will do is like it will give you an empty object that empty object is exposed like whenever you are trying to run your modules like in uh, Node.js it will give you four uh, default uh, where, sorry, uh, arguments and one of it is exports. So that export will be bound to this. So whatever you are applying that like I am um, putting uh, this dot ct is equal to coin photo that will get exported. But that is getting duplicated in the future releases because like that is making more confusions to people. So that will be get duplicated in the future releases. So that's why uh, we don't go and see. Okay, and then let's. Okay, we have another one kind of uh, like uh, this in Node that is called like when you are using this inside app function, it will give you global object. Actually, there is an object called global in Node.js like we have windows in uh, uh, browser so like when you are using it outside uh, functions it will give you exports but if you are using uh, inside your functions it will give you global object but I think <coughs> I can reproduce it Example. If I try to print this, actually we are using this outside here. We are not having functions, but still, Ripple runs it inside a function. So that's why we are getting global here. But it will not be the case when you are trying to run it in the uh, your normal node normal node here. So here we are getting global object so this is what when you try to access this object inside a function okay and then the next one is which is obviously everyone knows it like this is how the other languages works like we are having an object inside the object we are having this so it normally points to the current instance so if you are trying like it will try to find like point code is special like it's not it's not for it it's got an emphasis so like because like this is inside of an object and this is trying to uh, reference to current instance okay i'm sorry let us uh something like var we are using for declaring a variable i'm sorry yeah, latest block scope. 
Here they are just if you can use anything like you can use war, let, const, anything. It doesn't matter. It's just for declaring your variable. That's it. I just use because I use to. Okay. I think there is no questions in this. Okay, okay. Uh, here comes the other. This is the explicit binding. Here, what we are doing is like we are explicitly saying bind this particular object to this. I mean, as a particular object to in this way. I'm sorry, the code is getting bigger. Here we have two. Uh, uh, objects which is Tamil Nadu and Android, and then we have a function which is going to print like which is referencing this dot name and then this dot uh, capital. And in the first line, I'm trying to call print details with just bind uh, this with Tamil Nadu object. So whatever I'm referencing uh, with this will be get reference to Tamil Nadu and here I'm uh, calling the same function and I'm pausing a different object and that's called Andhra here and that Andhra will get a uh, reference to this in this call in this execution okay so if I run the same function will return Two different values because we are just binding two different objects when we are calling it. So I can decide what this can be during my call. Okay. So this will get called immediately. And I can also do another another thing that is called hard binding. That is, for example, I'm using. Bind here. This will return you another function. Unless uh, call or apply, it won't uh, call you immediately, but it will return you another function and it will call. I'm sorry. So it will instead of calling it immediately, it just binds your function with the given uh, uh, like uh, object, and then it returns you another function that you can use it for later time, and you can call it whenever you want. It can actually it can be used for currying also like something like you don't need to differently do your like stat or functions, and then you can curry, but like you can use this kind of a bind, and you can do it, but this is not recommended because like the performance will not be that much good when you're using bind for your current operations well. So if I'm trying to do the same so what should we expect? I can do it and then I can call it. Okay. Okay. Once I have bound to a function and then if it returns, I cannot bind it again for with another value. Because like here I am having this way. We are having some model. And I cannot get a If 
I cannot use this function to bind to another because like it's already bound and it's hot so it cannot bind it again. Though you try to bind it, it will just reference to the first bind and give you the same value. Okay. And this is hot binding. Okay. Now the next one, this is the last kind of binding which we have for this. Like when you're trying to use new keyword against your functions, like you can create an object that everyone knows. But like there is another one big topic which is out there, like prototypes. That is that will take another one full session. So like I'm just skipping for now. So we'll see like what will happen when you're trying to use a new uh, new uh, keyword against your uh, function and trying to instance something like instantiate it. So what we are having here is like I have a, a, a function called uh, city and then I have cost city name and then it's known for and then I'm just trying to access uh, this variable inside it and then I just assign and have a function called print. I'm trying to do it. So what will happen when you are calling your fun, uh, like function with new keyword before it? What it will do is like I'm trying to call it. It just go to the function. It creates an empty object for you, and then <coughs> that empty object is getting linked to this. So an empty object is given for you uh, in the name of this. So whatever you assign here will get assigned in the uh, the empty object. So now we have name, speciality, and then print. Those all are assigned in the uh, empty object. And this will be returned back uh, as the return value of your uh, function. So now <coughs> the same object which you have tried using and you have used uh, with this is a reference to Garu. So, like that's what you're getting here now. But there is an exception case. Here you can see that like, I do not have a return function. So that's why it is linked the same empty object which we have paused during the new got a link to, uh, I mean, uh, cut. But if I return anything, that will be a reference to, I mean, returned as the value instead of this. So this is like an, uh, a hidden uh, return statement which we have written. This is a hidden here. So if you are doing any, any explicit return, that will replace this and then it will go. So these are the references which I have done and normally like we have MDN and this is like massive uh, documentation for you like you can just go and refer okay. any topic if you want and then there is another one uh, like a, a book which is in uh, the free books uh, it's available in Gates um, that's written by Guy Simpson and it is called New, You Don't Know JavaScript. It's having a lot of uh, books, it's not a single book, it's having a lot of books and so many articles. And that's it. Any questions? What is the difference between var and lit? Var and lit. Actually, there are so many uh, differences. The first difference is like lit, get, uh, lit does not get uh, hoisted, like var get hoisted. Like what you have, what we have seen in the first uh, one, right? Like war will get hoisted, but the lid does not get uh, hoisted, and lid is a block scoped uh, thing, and war is function scoped. And there are so many. We can so these are the main differences between uh, war and lid. In lid, there is like a modem, but most of the other languages. Yeah. Like, how we want to behave. So, yeah, I think another way to look at it is you know, if you're looking using ESP, it's called Savage Metal. You don't really need to use more anywhere. You just have latent const. So, like, you won't get unexpected surprises for you. So, that's why like, we have latent const, which is introduced in uh, ES6, to avoid uh, those kind of unexpected behaviors from your code. That's also interesting because all the scopes, right? You know, the global, local, and the storage, that, and all that. Um, a few examples that we had, uh, 
the first time, right? That's, uh, it's, it's, you can even say it's an anti pattern. It's kind of yeah. illustrates clearly uh, you know, how unreadable it becomes, right? After some time, you'll be like, this, what will be the value that's coming out of it? This makes it hard to know exactly what will get assigned and so on, right? So it's always a, I think that's exactly where some other things you're explaining is probably can be taken as, yeah, this, this is the pain that will cause if we start using that way. <laughs> yeah, actually, thanks for bringing it up. Like most of the things which you have seen here, like this is how basically it works. But like now, Edmo scripts, new standards are trying to avoid these un unexpected things. Like so that like we will not expect. You can predict what you are going to get even you when you are writing. It. That's what uh, expected from your programs, right? Like when you are trying to write your program, you should know what should be the output. But like these kind of things, what you are seeing now. Is making you more agile and like you will not predict when you are uh, writing it code. It makes it more complex. So that's why we are having more standards like let uh, cons everything comes in to avoid this uh, kind of uh, unpredictability. Anything else? One more thing uh, I hope most of you have read. Uh, you know the world of browser, right? So you got. Uh, Instant code against year six or seven, and use the frameworks like Babel tools like this. Like, uh, like Babel, uh, you can actually it, it does it, it, it does the backwards compilation. So you can write against the modern specification, and then it takes care of compiling to the whatever the version of the output you want, like the uh, five or anything, right? That's um, so it's always something recommended to write as the modern version, and then use like a tools like the Babel to take care of. Mostly like these things live still because like we have we should have the backward compatibility because like we have so many websites which are already run, running based on these concepts. So if we try to stop all this or duplicate out uh, out of our compilers, like they all will get broken. So that's why we still have all this, but like we are trying to rectify all these kind of uh, like uncertainty with the new standards. Any any questions? Thank you.
So that's a good one for me to speak in this stage. So today I'll be covering the Jupyter Notebooks as well as the Microsoft Azure Learning Studio, Machine Learning Studio. So now we can see the machine learning is one of the one of the good in the market where people are a lot of data scientists and machine learning algorithm AI. Everyone is trying to read new things. Okay, but if at all if you want to start with the machine learning or any other software, so what we do is we need to install the software, so we need to prepare the data, and we need to execute. For example, if you want to learn .NET, what we will do? We'll download Visual Studio, we'll find out the Hello World program sample, then we will execute it. But when you take about the big data or machine learning stuff, there are different different softwares you need to use it. But how do you use it? It will be very difficult to install all the softwares in your local machine. So a lot of restrictions from your uh, computer, uh, sorry, uh, the IS team, a lot of software security and other stuff. So what we can do is we can use a simple browser where we can learn the machine learning studio. Uh, so the machine learning is a simple step. So that is the panda for this session. Okay. First, I will cover what about the Jupyter notebooks. Then I will take you to the what is machine learning studio. How we can use it the machine learning studio for our learning purpose. So this will be a very uh, introduction session. I am not going to cover any of the algorithms on the machine learning side. Just an introduction how you can get started with the machine learning. Learning. Okay. First of all, so what is Python? So Python is an uh, interpreter language. Okay. Then I okay. I will tell you why I am going to cover some of the few languages before going to the Jupyter notebooks. Then you will understand why I cover the other languages as well. First, we will cover the what is Python. Python is an interpreter language and it supports the object-oriented and dynamic language. And it is invented by like the first release by the Guido von Rousseau in the year of 1991. So advantages: it has a lot of supporting libraries. And it has a lot of integration features with other any web languages and HTML side, and improves the programmer's productivity. So these are the basic advantages of Python. And then the next one is R. So R is mainly used for the statistical computing purpose. Okay, so it uses a lot of users in the financial institutions. And uh, it is a different implementation of S. So it's another language called S. So it's a different implementation of S. And advantage, it has a lot of data handling and storage facility. It used good for the calculations, arrays, and uh, matrices, and it has give you graphical representations as well. So this is the R. And the next one is Julia. So Julia is another high performance and high level language. Again, it is used for the computation, calculations, and different purposes. And it is also a general purpose. It is not, uh, and it is used for the numerical computations as well. And it can easily integrate with the open source C and the Photon libraries for the linear algebra calculations. And advantages, it has good performance, it has a built-in package manager, how we have the NPM kind of stuff, it has it, and it easily can call the Python, it has an easy integration as well. And it, you can call it directly with the C functions as well. And the limitations is it's not fully stabilized and it is not for the scientific calculation, it's for the numerical purpose and it is a little slower. Okay, so now we'll come to this something called IPython. So IPython is called an interactive Python. So when you ex when you want to execute in a Python, so what you will do is 99 percent you will use the compile or sorry, command prompt. So we will write the command for the Python program and we will use Python then the program run dot py, then it will execute it. But what is IPython? So you can execute the Python program over a browser. So that's called IPython. That's what it mentioned is an interactive Python command shell. So you, you can say simply say the command run from the PowerShell. So you can think something like that. Uh, where you can execute the command Python program in a browser. So that is a major advantage. And it connects with the Jupyter kernel and it executes the code. I'll cover what is Jupyter kernel in the later slides. So the advantages is it maintains the input session and everything. So if these are the uh, traditional uh, or the default advantages. One thing is the last point is extensible system magic commands of controlling the environment and performing many tasks related to IPython on the system side. So what I, it means is you can use the IPython command where you can control the system. So that's an important feature. So the limitation is it does not save any of the sessions. Okay. And it doesn't provide any of the shortcuts or no syntax debugger. And so here the code all are the H, it is a mix of HTML and other stuff. So you cannot execute everything in a single shot. So you can execute step by step. 
and uh, there is no uh, it has a table of there is no table of contents that's it so now we'll come to the what is jupiter so the combination of julia and python and the r that's called the jupiter so that's the reason i covered slightly the python the r as well as the julia so now all this combination called jupiter okay so now what you can do is you can execute the interactive python command over in a browser either you can use in a python language or r language or in a julia so that's called julia so it contains so generally what you will do is in a notebook when you are discussing with the, of our colleagues what you will do is we will write some of the calculations some of the tables some of the simple statements and everything you will write for discussion over the discussion in jupyter <coughs> notebook or the jupyter also you can do the everything so generally what we do is when you write a com program so if you want if you the program does not want any set of code we will comment the line correct then we will put either the backslash or double slash we will put then we will execute here this code block has a different section and where this notebook contains the html as well as images as well as the medias as well as your program code so whichever program part you want to execute you have to select and execute then it will execute it so that's called the last statement says this document contain live code equations visualization and narrative text so advantages jupyter has it can you can do it for the data cleaning purpose or you can do the data transformations and you can do numerical simulations statistical modeling everything you can do in this jupyter okay it support 40 plus languages that means it does not only support the r or python even you can use the f sharp c sharp java and lot of other languages as well so it does not require that you need to learn python or you no need to uh, need to or you can use any language that already you know it and it can easily integrate with the big data systems as well and limitation of jupyter so it maintains the entire code the jupyter code is in a json format so when you are committing with your uh, visual studio or the tfs system it messes the version control it is, does not go well so that's what it says it messes up with your version control system so it is a big json so which contains your both code uh, input as well as output and so you have to execute the code only set of lines only so the history of jupyter and i python so it is released in the year of 2001 so almost 17 years ago the first uh, in 2014 fernando created a project called i python and called project jupyter in github 2015 so what they said is they have created an extension called ipy nb that's called i python notebook that's called ipy nb so what you can see is when you uh, for example when you create a new uh, project in github you can see the readme file.md in the browser itself correct so like this when you create a i python boi nb file you can see in the github itself that's what they have created it so how the jupyter works so when the user uh, creating a code and he is doing it everything in the browser when he says execute it it goes to the notebook server using the zero mq methodology and it detects the kernel whether should i use it the r or should i use it the <coughs> python or python 2 or python 3 c sharp f sharp whichever i need to use that finds out the zero mq and it executes it and it returns back the results to the browser so what is the computation uh, so the kernel kernel is nothing but the computational engine where <coughs> it executes your actual code that's called computation kernel or the computational engine so these are these are the list of available jupyter kernels like i python kernel i r kernel and the sas kernel i java i c sharp there are a lot many out there so the installation of jupyter notebooks it's given in this link i don't want to explain this because we don't want to install it on our local machine so we'll go with the uh, cloud version so what you can do is the microsoft provides the free uh, cloud versions so which is called notebook.azure.com so you can register with your hotmail or outlook ids then you can go to the existing samples that these are the four or five steps then you can clone the existing libraries or the existing programs in your library then you can execute it so this is the sample notebook so which are the line which is on the gray color that is are the executables so we can see the uh, which is our uh, im2 im so which is called input and the output you can see in the below the bottom you can see the output 3 is the 4 there is a 
and in between the using python as a calculators those are the narrative text which cannot be executed so this is what the python notebook sorry the jupyter notebook which contains both the narrative text as well as the programming codes so this is another sample which where you can get the data from the azure machine learning studio and you can use it in the python notebook so this is the way where it uses your api key and everything it gets the data then it processes it still have any doubt related to the jupyter notebook or the python It's basically, I would say, in a simple term, it's a pure compiler. So you, uh, while creating the program, you have to choose which kind of language that you are going to use, Python or uh, or or F sharp. Then, based on your selection, it will detect the kernel and execute it. So you said the version control is a problem. Is so how do you make it? So generally, what uh, as of now, what we are doing it is we are using the uh, Azure itself. We are storing the data. We are not bringing to your, our own uh, TFS or the uh, CDS system because even the Microsoft itself they are storing the versioning. So that's the reason we are not using it. Still, if you are interested, you can do it. It's not going to harm. But when you want to compare two files in the .s git or something, it will be difficult to see the difference. There is nothing else. Amazon Yes, it's very similar. So I haven't explored anything on the Amazon, but uh, um, Google they have something called Colab, where they have the Jupyter notebooks, and even Amazon also they have. One. Any other questions? I will give you the demo on the Jupyter notebooks in the upcoming slides. So. The next one will be the machine learning. So, anybody is already using or learning the machine learning? Okay, so machine learning is nothing but what you are going to do is you are going to detect or predict what is going to happen in the future based on your existing data. Whereas the big data, what you are going to be doing is you will be analyzing your data, but you are not going to predict more. But the machine learning, you will be predicting what will happen in the next. So that's the basic fund of the machine learning. It has a different different machine learning methods. One is called supervised machine learning, and the unsupervised and the semi-supervised, and the last one is reinforced machine learning algorithm. The supervised machine learning algorithm, you know the input and you will be knowing the output as well. Whereas the unsupervised, you will be knowing the input data, but you will not be knowing the output data. So you will not be doing anything basically. The semi-supervised, it mixed up the supervised and the unsupervised. Whereas the reinforced machine learning algorithms, little different. You will be giving the token or the appreciation based on your results, then it will react it. So that's called the reinforced machine learning algorithm. I'm not going to cover any of the algorithms in detail. I'm just giving what are the different methods are there. So next we will come to the machine learning studio. So this is the nice UI where Microsoft given for the machine learning studio. So these are the existing experiments which I have created already. So you can use simple the navigation menu patterns, click the new one, create the new machine learning studio and you can start with it. So this is the very simple example. So what I have done is I have created a CSV file. It's a very simple CSV file. I have uploaded it to the machine learning uh, sorry. Azure Machine Learning Studio, then I am processing the data using the Python, I am printing some of the data, I am just doing in a hello world application, nothing else. So these are the four or five lines which you have to use it, okay. For this either you have to uh, learn the pandas, there are different uh, libraries of that, you have to learn that. So this is the pandas library, so where it is mainly used for the data processing. So what I'm doing is I'm reading the data and I'm iterating one by one and I'm appending the hello and I'm printing it. That's it. Nothing else. So for example, in each and every language like the Java or C sharp, we have the main method as the entry point. So here the Azure ML underscore main is the entry point for the machine learning steps. So the output will be like this. So I have read all the uh, five rows and I'm printing one by one. And you can compare the results either using the visualization or statistic. As of now, it is only one column, so there is no need to use any of the visualizations. So 
So let's see the demo of this. So I'll just sign, sign in. If at all if you want to create new book notebooks, then you can use these notebooks. So now we will use the experiments. So then you have to click the black experiment. So then you will get the UI like this. So everything is a drag and drop and it's very simple. So what you have to do is if you have any of the existing data set you have uploaded, you can use it. So these are the data sets that is provided by the Azure libraries. If you have your own data sets. Just so let me, let me log into other account. So this is the one that I have already created. So we have the already saved data sets. So when you click the my data sets, it's this. So you can do a drag and drop wherever you want to use it. And so whenever you use, let me create a new one. This is our first input. So the next one, so there are a lot of option, different options are available for the data processing. So we'll use the Python one. So we'll tell, so take this data from the name, name dot CSV and we'll use it for the input for the Python program. So it's a simple drag and drop. Okay. So every Python program or the every connector, it supports three input parameters. So you can see here there are three dots are there. So one dot is for two dots, first two dots for your input data set, and third one is for the script bundle. Suppose if you are writing your own library and you want to use it, then you can use the script bundle. And so now what we can do is we'll copy the date program from here. So already they have given some of their sample uh, lines. So let me remove. Let me just aggregate it really like this. So it is successfully aggregated. So if you want to see the output, you can click here. So then you can see the visualize. So you can see the output here. It's very simple on uh, when you want to get started with the machine learning. So you are not installed anything or you are not violated any of your uh, office policies or something. It's everything runs on your browser. So suppose if you are having a lot of data sets or the data set columns, then you can compare the columns within a different uh, 
parameters. So if you have three or four pipes, then you can compare here as well. So let us try the same thing with the OR. Yes, it contains only the names columns. I will show you that as So the next one is, it's very simple, it's the same as the Python. So the only bit will change the programming code. The output will be very similar. So here, what we are doing is, here the, uh, what is the language syntax is slightly different. So like how the Java, C Sharp, or Fosco, everything is getting different, different syntax. But the logic is same, so I'm taking the input, then I'm appending with the hello, then I'm just sending it to the output port. That's it. Okay, so let's go back. So let me try. Just drag and drop, connect the same way. Copy the three flags, save. So it is it's executed. So see the output. Let's click here. Let's see visualize. So the output is same. So I'll show you the input file. So so this is the input file. So while uploading, it will ask you whether uh, uh, you are having the Excel, the CSV file with header or without header. It supports the TSV file with header, without header. And you can out, uh, import the or data sets as well. So this is the different uh, mechanism. So or a different uh, example which is already present in the uh, machine learning studio itself. So it detects how the breast cancer data, how you can manipulate it, and how you can get the uh, future results based on the machine learning algorithms. So let me show you the uh, samples with the notebooks. So let me sign in. So here now we can click the libraries, then we can select any one of the existing libraries, then click here, then clone, so then it will clone into our libraries. So it is asking where to clone, and whether it is asking whether you want to use it a public or private. So if you select a public one, then everyone in the internet, if they search us, then you, you will get it. So if you are using it for any official purpose, then untick this. So let's select the simple one, introduction to Python. So whatever I say, this is the uh, text part, it won't get executed. So these are the bits, which is in the program. So when you you can select and you have to execute it. 
this is the one of the uh, disadvantages. You have to select your coding block one by one, then you have to execute it. This is a slight disadvantage of using the notebook. <coughs> and here you can see what kind of languages it uses. It says Python 2. If you want to change it to Python 3, then you can go to the file menu, then you can change the sorry, you can change the kernel here. Whether you want to use F sharp or Python 2, 3 or 3.6, you can change the kernel here. So I'm going to change it to 3. It says kernel starter and the language is changed to Python 3. So if you are using any specific to Python 3, then you can use it. Now it is supports here as well, so it executes. So if you want to use it for any calculations, then you can just select and run, it executes. And uh, this is for some calculations. If you want to use the change the kernel to R or something, then you can go to kernel then you can change the kernel. So then you have to change your code to the R, then only it will execute, otherwise you will get a compilation. So these are the things that I want to cover. So get, just get started with the Jupyter notebook and put some introduction about the machine learning studio. We can see a lot of examples in the machine learning studio when you click here. You can go to any experiment. So these are the different samples that already Microsoft has given it. But I would recommend uh, just to understand any one of the algorithms first. Then if you try, it would be easy to understand. Otherwise, it will be a little difficult to understand. Any other questions? Yes, it's free. You can use your Hotmail or Outlook account. Or if your office is already tied up with the Azure, then you can use that as well. Yes, you can do that. Yes, you can do that. You can use it as an ETL tool, kind of an ETL tool as well. Yes, you can use it. No, no, it doesn't. No, that's different. SSA is completely different. So here what you can do is, for example, you are getting a CSV data, you want to apply some of the transformations or you want to get it in a column by or row wise, just you can do it. But SSIS is completely in a different area. Here also you can do, but up to certain extent. There's no integration. No, no. Jupyter network, uh, you use it for a big, uh, you know, slice and stop things you want to demonstrate in all these things. I mean, do you, so uh, as you said, it will be very good when you are discussing with your business team or something. Then Jupyter notebooks is very easy because even you can when you are discussing, you can write your comment and text and everything. And even Jupyter notebooks, you can do a lot of visualizations. It can easily integrate with the P3JS and other libraries also. Even you can use it for the production purposes. So in quantum, we are also in the stage of learning side only. So we also did a couple of programs. Still, we are exploring more options from the Jupyter notebooks. So this uh, is No, as of now there is no constraint. Yeah, you can use it. You can even you can use some of the public data as well, which is already available. So I mean the size of the file. No, you can upload any size. You, it can be uploaded into your libraries. Then you can use it. For which one? The Jupyter Notebooks or uh, the Learning Studio? Learning Studio. It is just an integration with the different applications internally. Like uh, they have the, uh, like, you uh, know, different, different compiler. It detects based on the which kernel that you are calling. Then it go and it find out its compiler, then it executes the code. For deep learning, you have tensor code. Yes. No, that is depends when you are using uh, algorithm. TensorFlow is from the Google. Yes. Yes. So here they are calling this a uh, machine learning itself. That's it. Does uh, Azure offer any different kinds of libraries like you have used on us here? Mm -hmm. So similarly, uh, does it also have an extensive list of libraries or do I import during the. So if it is not there, then you have to import by using the zip bundle. Okay. So this can have different libraries. Yes, you can import it. 
Medipal is uh, having the founders, SciPy, NumPy, everything. If you want to use any of your third party libraries, then you can import as well. And you can easily export the data from Azure ML to the notebooks, so that, that also you can do a lot of processing. Okay. So the output generation part, we create different metrics, right? like a conclusion matrix or different citation charts. All those things, is it possible to show it in Azure as well? Yes, it is possible. Because it basically it uses the Jupyter notebooks as well as their, their own algorithm, the same algorithm. So it executes. So basically, you are getting a different interface, that's all. If you are using in a, a notepad plus plus, it's different. When you are using in a Visual Studio, it's different. Both the places you can write in a C sharp or Java code, correct? That's it. Different. Uh, so here you showed like uh, you are like providing your data. Code. So if you want to provide like dynamic data to Jupyter, so, so you can use the web services calls. Okay, so they have web services. Yes, so you can use it. Yes. Even whatever you are doing here, also you can uh, expose as a web service. So here uh, you have an option called the setup as web services. Then whatever you are doing it here, you can export as a web service. Then in a cl different client application, you can import it or you can consume it. So even the output you can consume it. Yes, different. Yes, that that is also possible. And if you are doing a new uh, algorithm or a new design, then you can do publish to gallery, so it will be available for the others as well. And uh, even it maintains the run history also. We can see when you have executed and what is the output and everything. On that particular stage, you can even lock that history. So then you can basically you can undo modifications on that. So it's a loss. <coughs> so you can see different different versions and when it goes locked. Any other questions? Okay. okay, so everything is on the cloud. Okay, for example, if you want to use your data into the machine learning, sorry, the notebooks. So I can select the, uh, I'm having the data set here. So I want to use it on the uh, uh, Python notebook as a notebook server. So then I can click here. Now the data will be exported into the notebook server, then I can use it. So you can see here, so it got the data and even it's rendered the data as well. No, it's not right. No. Even Google, they have something called the Core App. You can use a very similar, whatever we are using, the Azure Notebooks. You can use it there also. It is just an, uh, giving an idea how you can use the existing tools rather installing it on your local and using it. So basically when you are as a software developer, there will be some of the uh, infrastructure team where they will do all this work. But so that we can start, then later we they can install and we will start now. Here we are directly going to start it. Sorry, I didn't get it. So what you are asking is, uh, can I use the Jupyter Notebook on your local machine as well as the cloud is same? That's what it Yes, it's both are same. As long as the Jupyter Notebook version on the cloud is same, on your local, then it will be same. It depends upon what version that you are using. Uh, I, I just want to understand that uh, the Jupyter is only used for how you visualize the operation. So same thing that Jupyter does, I can do just using normal R and everything, right? <coughs> so what, uh, what advantages that Jupyter do over there? Okay, so when you are using the R, okay, so you will be using only one language, and if you want to see the output, then you will execute the program, then you will see the output, okay? Here it is not that. You can having a mixer of text, as well as a HTML content, as well as your images, and you can use including JavaScript libraries, everything you can see in a single page itself. Okay, so it's like a whole framework for Yes. You mean that I can uh, actually uh, implement all, all kinds of programs and everything? 
No, that you cannot do. So yeah, either it should support either Python or uh, sorry any one kernel that you can select. For each kind of statement, then you cannot have a different different kernel. So th that's your question, correct? No, it it supports either you have to use either only any one of the kernel only at a time. It's not like that. Uh, each line of statement it cannot be that what kind of kernel it is. It should be only one kernel. But it supports a lot of different kernels like SAS, Java, different kernels. In the same page itself. Like, you mean like, what is the exact like, I don't understand. Actually, we can actually uh, give comments in the normal, uh, any kind of user ID. Uh, but what is the use of this ID? Okay, so, okay, so when you are using a simple Python program, okay, so what you will do is you will write in a command line statement. And it will, when you execute the program, okay, so you will see the output. You will not see the, any of the rich HTML content or any of the visualizations over there, correct? But whereas in the Jupyter Notebooks, you can see the HTML content. So you can have nicely designed and everything, okay? And in, between, in the below, you have the programming statement. It will give you the output. Even you can uh, format the output with the different HTML contents. So you can make sure that the output is more visualized Visualized. Yes, see here when you look at the introduction to Python, okay, you see this one. So when you are executing a program or in the Python, when you are writing a default Python, so this will be in your .py file. And when you execute, when you give an output, and you, if you are getting this is the output, you will not see it, correct? This part, the end user cannot be seeing it, correct? But here it is not like that. Anyone can see it. So they can see the step by step what's executing. Actually, where, where it is written actually, I mean, like, that. This, like H, a, this, this one? Of written, where it is written, I mean, like in the code. It's not the code. So you, here you can insert it, anything that you want. So this is in a markup, markdown language that it, uh, GitHub uses. It's very similar to that. So when you use a single hash, it gives you a you know, bold letters and a bigger font. So yes, that's so yes, that's it. Nothing else. And so you can do things like uh, you can have like uh, you can share with others easily. Yeah. Like, you know, it's easy to distribute. And somebody when they uh, receive the snippet of code, they can see the code, see the results, change the code, execute it there and look at. So it enables all this collaboration easily. So, you know, all in all in browsers, all in this browser. Yes, it, it even you can support it via uh, Google Drive. So, so you can share it on Google Drive as well. Sorry? Yes, they can also execute. Yes, without logging, yes. they can, uh, yes. without logging, they like can single click, we can execute and see the code. My question is that we can only uh, import CSV files or we can import it? TSV files and it supports four or five formats. That's it, nothing else. Most of the data it will be on a CSV format. Not on a JSON format, so that's all. No. Even I'm trying that. <coughs> so you can import the JSON as a into a text file. Then you have to using the any pandas library, you can convert into JSON. Then you can uh, split the columns and other values. Then you can process. It. By default, there is no support. So, the data set can be pulled. Uh, can be pulled from any database. Uh, no. So these are a different formats where you can use the data sets. So these are the, as of now, these are the data sets that supports. If you want to use uh, import it, then you can use the, any of your web services, then you can use the .NET code, then you can import it. That's a good thing, rather than using it as an XML file. Can we just uh, connecting to database in this code runs? Written the browser on this machine, like run somewhere else, right? Uh, from there, the database should be accessible. Otherwise, it's all just Python code, it can run, you know, any piece of code, connect to database, it can do many things. But uh, it complicates the simple setup that we have, right? It's not simple anymore. Uh, then, probably, it's better off to write simple Python script that executed from uh, some other language. Otherwise, you can export your data as a web services using an HTTP protocol, then you can pass some of the arguments, then it gets downloaded. That's the easiest way. What about syncing? If I get any data in my database, mm. they sync it with clients. No, you have to. Otherwise, you have to publish as a web services when you. Not to publish, if 
if you do any modification in the future, let's see to me your bank. No, you are not getting it. It is not an array of time. It's okay. Because that input data is get changed, so you have to execute and see what's happened. And after that, really the time, so the time will have to. Yes. We download some data sets from you. You have Kaggle data sets. Yes. So if you download it and you use it directly, you can put it directly here or do you have to do it? No, no. Uh, if it's in a CSV file, you can just use the CSV with the header or without header, then you can use it. Kaggle, most of the people, they use the CSV, so you can uh, upload it directly. Okay. Honestly, I have to convert it into CSV. Yes, then you have to use it. Yeah. Any questions, suggestions? Thank you, Thank you.